New data and big data sources in COPD. What can we learn? Registry database mining, limitations and benefits. A brief description. Big database studies include more representative patient populations and can answer questions that cannot be addressed by randomized control trials. When I'm asked about the advantages of big database studies, they really afford a window into real life patients in clinical practice. They can of course be purely descriptive, used to characterize patients and prescribing patterns. This is important to identify gaps in quality of care and to guide educational and research priorities. They can also be used to analyze associations between prescribing patterns and clinical outcomes for a broad, diverse, real life patient population, as well as specific subgroups who are typically excluded from RCTs, such as active smokers or those with comorbidities. They can also be used to generate hypotheses for further studies because of their access to data for a large number of patients. Big database studies can zero in on patient subgroups, for example, to examine sex-related differences in clinical characteristics and outcomes. And it's important that even large-scale RCTs can be non-representative. If we take a classical um, paper that looked at this, um, the Prieto Centurion paper, um, looking at over a thousand patients aged over 40 years of age, 45% of those patients with a physician diagnosis of COPD did not make clinical trial criteria for defining COPD. In the Herland paper from Respiratory Medicine in 2005, they, they reported that only 7% of patients with COPD would be eligible for RCTs. And RCTs have overt inclusion criteria, known risk factors, smoking, lung function, comorbidities, adherence, inhaler technique. They also have covert ones. You know, doctors may not include patients that are difficult to manage in a clinical trial setting. Often those with the more unstable disease or those with many comorbidities. If we think about the benefits and limitations, I mean the limitations clearly with observational studies can only show association but not causation. It's restricted to the data in the database and longitudinal power of the database. They need rigorous analytical methods to avoid confounding factors. Benefits, as previously mentioned, observational database studies can evaluate effectiveness in a larger and broader population and generate new hypotheses. They can also be used to examine the comparative effectiveness of different therapies, and they can also answer questions unanswerable in an RCT because of ethical considerations or inability to blind the treatments or procedures being compared. They can also, in terms of benefits, address outcomes that will not be seen in RCTs. For example, medications that are easier to take or inhalers that are easier to use. Therapy with maybe a faster onset of action, which a patient may be more likely to take. Therapy with more tolerated and less side effects. Um, therapy which provides better outcomes. Also, they may be much less expensive to conduct than RCTs. Observational studies should clearly complement RCTs to provide a more continuous, integrated approach to evidence. How do we optimize big database studies? We certainly need to make sure that the data is representative as well as large. So we need robust, high quality research databases. We need a priori protocols signed off by independent steering committees, a priori study registration with a commitment to publish, rigorous analytical methods to reduce bias, minimize confounding and adjust for any residual confounding, transparent reporting of course, as outlined in the STROBE guidelines. What questions can big database studies? Well, um, one paper that we published in the International Journal of COPD was how was COPD being currently managed in the un United Kingdom? And we looked at the management of 20, just under 25,000 patients. And we clearly found that COPD was not being managed according to national and international guidance. And in fact, 50% of patients almost at the gold stage two were receiving ICS, clearly outside licenses. A more recently published paper in the last week or so, looking at the time to triple therapy, examining just under 12,000 patients in UK primary care, um, found that a high proportion of patients with COPD were prescribed inhaled steroids upon initial diagnosis. And what this resulted in was an inevitable drift of expensive and potentially harmful triple therapy. 
So it is important, I think, that type of data shows us the value of getting therapy right at the beginning. Another paper that we published in the International Journal of COPD looked at fine particle ICS versus extra fine particle ICS therapy for COPD. Um, it's interesting that the patients may, may benefit more because they have more peripheral disease has been argued and they may have poor inhaler technique which might be benefited from a, a smaller particle ICS. So what we evaluated was smokers and ex-smokers with COPD aged over 40 initiating or stepping up their dose of, of ICS as either extra fine or fine particle. They were matched on key baseline um, criteria and their outcomes evaluated over two subsequent years. And what we found is that they were, they were likely to be given a smaller dose of ICS when used extra fine and most outcomes were at least as good and in terms of uh, treatment stability, which was no exacerbation or treatment change, they were significantly more likely to achieve that with the extra fine formulation. So I hope these three examples illustrate for you the value of using big data. And it's, it's wonderful to see such papers now getting published on a regular basis within the International Journal of COPD. Thank you for listening.